would take an anthropologist to sort it out. And when we do sort out what we know about rock art, we come up with a lot of reasons for making it. A lot of Anglos who don't know anything about it will say, well, how do you know it's just, it's not just doodling, it must be doodling. I doodle this, so everybody else must doodle this. It's just meaningless pastime kinds of things. And the reason we don't think it's, it's doodling is it doesn't fit our expectations of what a lot of doodling would look like. It's, it's much more patterned than doodling. You've got these, these terrific styles that pattern out very well through time and space. And they do appear to be, a lot of them are quite narrative, like the one we just saw. And when we talk to people who still make rock art or whose recent ancestors make rock art or the accounts from the late um, 1800s about people making rock art all over North America and frankly most of the rest of the world, it's usually done in a ritual context. It's usually got some kind of spiritual meaning or an historical commemoration. There's usually some reason for it other than mindless defacement of, of rocks. So I've divided these reasons up into um, a couple of categories that, that we can look at. And the first one is that rock art often records important information. And that might be information about a vision and a vision quest. Even just that I had a vision in this place and here's where I'm commemorating it and now I'm an adult. Or now I have weather control powers or, or now I can help you out, help out my family in, in hunting, which are things that shamans did, but also just many individuals in Native American cultures pursued visions and obtained supernatural power, what we would call supernatural power. It's just a natural power if this is part of your cosmology or worldview. We've got, we're recording information about social groups, whether it's um, puberty rights or an ethnic group or a family group about pilgrimage, about territories and land use rights, trails, where the resources are. So a lot of rock art in the southwest has been interpreted to point to where springs or tinajas are, where, where you find water sources hidden in the desert. We have astronomical alignments, which a lot of Rock art enthusiasts specialize in the astronomy, so I don't have to. So if you ask me ask astronomy questions at the end, I'm going to defer to other people in the audience. And we might have information about um, migration, about agricultural cycles and calendars for, for agriculture. Then a second major category of rock art that we see a lot with hunter-gatherers, so on the Columbia Plateau, Great Basin. Rock art, making rock art is a part of a process of mediating between the spirit and the spirit world. So you're directly communicating with the spirit world, whether it's ancestors or forces of nature. So you're usually doing this on behalf of your social group. So you're obtaining helping spirits or communicating with them about hunting, about farming, fertility, medicine, this kind of thing. And I guess this is more a corollary of that category than a new one. The process of making rock art might be more important than the images that you produce. So a lot of work is starting to be done, be, is starting to be done on the acoustical properties of rock art sites. So it looks like people were choosing places with natural echoes to put a lot of rock art. And that might have something to do with the sound it makes when you're pounding the rock or scraping the rock to make the mark, that that's reverberating and increasing the power of whatever you're doing. So the way it feels, the way it looks when you're doing it, the way it sounds when you're doing it, that might be the purpose rather than the mark that's left behind. And then worldwide, there's, there's lots of reasons for making 
marks on the rock. And we can't always figure that out from archaeological evidence alone. So it, it's certainly possible, and we can find examples where it is doing like a sort of random self-entertainment kind of behavior, but um, that really does seem to be a minority of cases for the area that we're talking about. So here, here's an example that's pretty easy to understand. Alexander Stephen was an ethnologist working at Hopi in the late 1800s, and in his journal of 1890, he asked some Hopis, what's this shield figure that's engraved above the trail, now the body of the road? up to the first Mesa villages. So if you're going up there for the harvest festival or a dance, walk instead of drive. Uh, there's no place to park up there anyway. Uh, park at the bottom and take a linearly walk up and look at that cliff face and you'll see this still there today. It hasn't got a patina on the rock, so the light has to be right here. You have to, to really know what you're looking for. And this is it. It's a big shield figure. And then it has these little tally marks and Hopi's said that this commemorated a battle. And the, the caption there says, Tally of Slave Apache. And then it has the Hopi word Apache slain mark. And Apache women uh, rubbing about three foot in my word. So this commemorates an event. This site is northwest of Tuba City. Uh, unfortunately, on Navajo Tribal Trust land. So to go here, you get a permit from the Navajo Nation Cultural Preservation Office. And this is called Willow Springs or Tatumani Footprint Markings. A biography of a Hopi gentleman that's published as Sun Chief explains that Hopi men from Third Mesa in making their salt trail pilgrimage to the Grand Canyon would stop at this place and make prayers and leave their clan symbol. And if you made this pilgrimage many times, you would leave your clan symbol next to the one you did last time, or you might put it next to your uncle's clan symbol because your clan comes to you from your mother, so you're sharing that with, with her brother. So you might be um, guided on your first pilgrimage by your uncle, and you might add your clan symbol where he was putting his. So you get these rows of clan symbols, and Hopi's still today can tell you which clans those are. So Dennis is next to some um, badger paws there, and then you have coyote heads for the coyote clan. And then down below here, where it's harder to see because there's less desert varnish, you've got it. Oops. These little mounds for the sand clan. Mounds of sand. Some close-ups here of spider clan symbols and the sun clan symbol. So they're commemorating making this pilgrimage. And this kind of gives you the, the setting. It's a very dry desert, but there are springs nearby. You 